what's up everybody my name is andrew and i recently renovated this very basement taking it from the sad original situation that you're seeing right now and turning it into this this video is going to go through every aspect of the basement finishing process from start to finish and the first couple minutes of this video is going to be a time lapse of the entire basement renovation process so you can see exactly what went into finishing it if you like what you see in the time lapse you can watch the rest of the video which is going to go through every single project that you saw in the time lapse in detail and show you how to do it yourself so if that sounds good drop a like down below subscribe to the channel and enjoy this basement finishing video
Hey everybody, my name is Andrew and I appreciate you checking out this basement transformation. If this video is giving you some value, I really would appreciate if you could drop a like down below. It really helps me out with the YouTube algorithm. And if you enjoy DIY content like this, consider subscribing. Thanks.
So that's a wrap on this basement project. If you enjoyed the video, please drop a like down below and subscribe for more DIY content like this. I have a free ebook down in the description that goes through every step of this basement remodel in detail. And if you're wondering what's behind this door, this was a bathroom I added to the basement, which I'm going to be tackling in the next series. So subscribe if you want to see that. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. What's going on guys? So on today's video, we're gonna take this old nasty staircase that was in my home when I first bought it, and we're gonna step things up a bit, turning it into this. And although they said it could not be done, we were able to do it for under $200 in materials. So the first step in remodeling the staircase is to remove the existing staples, nails, and screws that were used to hold the original carpet to the staircase. Because my stairs were previously covered in carpet, there were a ton of nails, screws, and staples that were used to hold that carpet down. If anybody knows why you need a screw to hold down carpet, let me know in the comments. I spent most of my time removing the carpet staples using a screwdriver and then a pair of pliers to pull the staples out that were a little more stubborn. And the biggest pain in the butt was all of this carpet and the staples used to hold it in place that was under the nosing. So that was pretty uncomfortable to pull out, but you just got to do it. So remove all the staples, screws, whatever you have for your specific existing staircase. And after removing all the staples, I removed the handrail because I'm going to take that outside, sand it down and paint it before reinstalling it later. Lastly, I vacuumed up any dirt and debris in preparation for the next step. Now, because we're going to be talking about stairs throughout this entire video, let's spend a few seconds to talk about the anatomy of a staircase. So as you can see from this picture, the horizontal piece you step on of the stair is called the tread. The nosing is what overhangs the vertical piece, which is called the riser. And then you have stringers on both sides of the staircase. Now, although you could do this later, I decided to paint the stringer beforehand. And to do this, I started by caulking between the stringer and the drywall. I used a paint sprayer to paint the stringers, but a paintbrush will work just fine. After prepping the stringers, the next step is to cut our actual stair treads, and to do that, we're going to cut strips out of a 4x8 sheet of plywood. Start off by measuring the length and the width of the stair, and do this at a few locations for each stair since there could be some variability. For my stair treads, I really wanted to use a 4x8 sheet of oak plywood, but unfortunately when I got to my local Home Depot, all they had was this quarter inch sanded pine plywood, which is not ideal, but I decided to roll the dice and just hope for the best. Now, in order to cut the plywood to fit the existing treads, I simply transposed the measurements that I made on the existing tread, and then I used a straight edge to mark that all the way across. Next up, I clamped down the straight edge to offset the distance between my circular saw and the circular saw guide, so that when I ran the circular saw along the straight edge, it would cut directly on my line. This is something you can use if you don't have access to a table saw, but this will ensure that you get a perfectly straight cut. I'm gonna need safety. I highly recommend that you measure each stair tread individually because for my staircase in particular, I saw a lot of variance from one stair tread to the other. So continue to make your measurements, transpose those measurements onto the plywood, and use a circular saw or a table saw to cut all of your treads to size. I freehanded some of my cuts, but I mostly use a straight edge as a guide for the rest. If you have any jagged edges, clean those up with some sandpaper. After cutting your new stair treads to size, it's time to install them. After cutting the plywood treads to size, you want to dry fit them on top of the existing tread to make sure it's a good fit. If everything looks good, apply some liquid nails to the top of the existing tread and the bottom of the new tread and then place the new stair tread in place. Apply a bit of elbow grease to make sure that the new tread is embedded in the construction adhesive and then use a handful of brad nails to secure it permanently. Make sure that the new tread is flush with the existing riser with some sandpaper. And here I am moving on to the next stair tread, applying construction adhesive to both the existing tread and the bottom of the new tread and then placing it on top firmly embedding it into the construction adhesive, and then again, using a bunch of brad nails to secure it in place. So I actually borrowed this electric framing nailer from my brother-in-law, which reminds me I should probably give that back. But I also have a pneumatic nail gun, and I'll link all the tools that I use in the description down below. Also, feel free to use some weights to help push the new treads down into the construction adhesive. Next up, we need to cut the bull nose or the nosing, which is gonna go on the front of the stair that gives it that rounded look. Let me show you what I mean. And just like the stair treads, I really wanted to use an oak hardwood strip for the nosing, but they only had pine common wood. So 
Again, I decided to try to make some, some lemonade out of these, these pine lemons. So I'm using my router here and a three quarter inch roundover bit. I'll link all those in the descriptions to give myself a nice rounded bull nose on both sides of the pine piece of two by one. This was pretty iterative, but it was pretty fun after putting on my respirator. It's a nice satisfying rounded look once you get it right and clean up any jagged edges with some sandpaper. Next up, measure the length of the stair near the nosing and cut your nosing and or bull nose to size. I used a miter saw, but you can use a circular saw just as easy. After cutting the bull nose to length, you're going to go ahead and position it in place on the front of the stair and you want to make sure that you use a good amount of wood glue before actually pushing it into place. Additionally, you want to make sure that the nosing is at least flush with the tread or maybe a little bit higher than the tread and you can sand it down later. Then use brad nails to secure it in place. After installing the tread and the nosing for the first couple stairs, I repeated the process going one by one down the rest of the staircase. After getting the treads on, continue to apply glue to the back end of the nosing and then push it up against the stair tread so that it protrudes a little bit higher than the stair tread. We're gonna sand that down later so it's flush. If you plan to stain your stairs, you really wanna make sure that you remove any wood glue that might get on the stair treads or the nosing because if you don't, you're gonna have the issue I had in just a few minutes. Also, when you're attaching the bull nose, you wanna make sure that the nosing is a little bit above the stair tread. That way, if it's a little bit above, you can sand it down. You don't want it to be below because then you have to sand down the plywood, which is already really thin. After installing all the stair treads and the nosings, it's time to prepare to stain the treads. And if you're gonna be staining your stairs, I recommend that you start with a wood conditioner so you get a more uniform stain. I used a wood stain manufactured by Verithane and just applied it using a cloth to the surface of all the treads and the nosing. So I spent a lot of time going back and forth picking the right stain for my stairs and I still messed it up, but what are you going to do? So do you remember when I said to make sure that you get the wood glue off if you plan on staining your steps? Well, here's why. As you can see, it is extremely blotchy where I attached the nosing to the stairs because I clearly didn't get all the glue off, even though I thought I did a kind of good job. So I had to get a little creative and I purchased some gel stain and gel stain is a little bit better than the oil base because it kind of sits on top of the stair and you can kind of get away with a bad glue wipe off job. So I bought this stain, I applied it over the existing stain and although I didn't love the color, at least I got a uniform look. Hopefully you can learn from this mistake. So after applying your stain, I highly recommend that you apply a polyurethane top coat. And polyurethane is basically a, you know, like a polymer plastic coating that gives you a layer of protection over your stair treads. And because we had to use pine plywood for this since they were out of hardwood, it's a much softer wood that will dent like crazy. So I did like three or four coats of this polyurethane to give it the most durability possible. I applied the polyurethane top coat using a paintbrush and it starts off kind of white, but dries clear. So for my staircase, I chose to reuse and just paint my existing risers, except for the bottom step where there was no riser at all. So the first thing I did is I took a two by six piece of lumber, I put it in with some screws, and then I had some leftover hardboard from my cabinets, which I basically just cut as a riser and stuck it in place. But if you wanna replace all your risers, you can buy something called hardboard from your local big box store, and that's gonna work just fine. So here I am cutting out the leftover hardboard from my cabinets to use as a riser on the bottom step and I'm cleaning up any jagged edges with some sandpaper. Next, apply the new hardboard riser to the step and use construction adhesive and brad nails to secure it in place. Next up, you're gonna to wanna to caulk where the risers intersect with the treads and also the intersections of the treads and the stringers. And to do this, I just masked everything off with tape and then applied an even bead of caulk. You're also then gonna to wanna to go back and paint everything to your desired color. I went with an ultra pure white semi-gloss for the stringers and also for the risers. I said that weird. And at this point, all that's left are a few finishing touches like installing LVP flooring, which will be another video, installing some trim at the new riser and the new LVP flooring that we installed, and then removing the painter's tape to reveal the final result. Here's a quick reminder of where we started. And here's a look at the final result. So overall, I'm kind of happy with how things turned out, but I would definitely use a hardwood plywood in the future, and it honestly might be worth just buying the pre-made treads. Although the method I used was pretty cheap, it was with pine, which I'm concerned won't last that long, even though the after photos you were looking at were after a year. 
What's up everybody? On today's project, I'm gonna show you how to install rigid foam insulation on basement walls. This will include how to trim it to size, how to apply the adhesive, how to trim around obstructions like windows, and how to tape the seams so that you can ultimately install drywall and finish the basement if that's your desire. So without wasting time, let's get into the video. So when I bought this house, the basement was a mess and the previous homeowner looked like they started to finish the basement, but it's a good thing they didn't because everything was a disaster. With everything out of the way, the first step in installing rigid foam insulation is to measure the height of your basement walls. In my case, they were around seven foot, eight inches. So I had to trim a little bit off the eight foot sheets of this rigid foam insulation, which is made by Owens Corning under the name Foamular. So I marked the height and then I used a six foot level as a straight edge. And you're going to use a utility knife to score along the surface of the foam. And then you can basically snap it in half like you're seeing now. It cuts pretty similar to drywall in terms of the score and snap procedure. Repeat the scoring and snapping procedure for all the pieces needed for your project. So a quick note, before you actually install any kind of insulation in your basement, you need to make sure that you don't have any kind of water issue. There's a couple tests you can do to make sure that your walls aren't accumulating moisture, but I'm not gonna cover that in this video. With the insulation cut to the right height, I'm gonna stand it up in place and I'm gonna use a level and a utility knife to score around that window so that I can snap off the piece of insulation there. Now I'm gonna use this special foam board adhesive, which I'm gonna apply to the back of the rigid foam insulation boards. And I'm gonna do this vertically in the event that any water that ever gets on the back will be able to make its way down as opposed to horizontally. Then I'm gonna trim off the remaining portion around the window, just like we did before. For each piece of rigid foam insulation, apply a few beads of the adhesive and then stand the board up in place, being sure to apply firm, even pressure to make sure that the rigid foam insulation is contacting the basement wall uniformly all the way across. I used a two by four to hold it in place while the adhesive dried. And what you're seeing here is I'm continuing the rigid foam insulation installation along that wall, cutting around the window with a utility knife, applying the adhesive to the back of all the boards, standing them up in place and then using two by fours to hold it in place temporarily while the adhesive sets up. As you can see for this last piece here, I had to cut around that water pipe. That wasn't an issue. I just used the utility knife to cut out that one area and you'll see me zoom in right here to show exactly what that looks like. Finally, there's that last little strip, which I cut to size and applied with adhesive. Next, you're typically going to want to apply some kind of seam tape between the board seams. I recommend Tyvek tape, but basically you want to apply a tape so there's not a draft that comes in between the boards. Trim it to size at the bottom as shown with a utility knife. So after taking care of the first wall in my basement, it was time to install the foam board over the second wall. And again, I trimmed the height to size, brought everything inside. And after performing a dry fit and trimming around any obstructions like windows, I added more of the adhesive before standing the board up in place and pushing the foam board against the wall, being sure to get good contact. I then filled in the last piece and went back and taped all of the seams in between boards. And before wrapping up, I wanted to show how I installed insulation around this bump out. First, I cut the first piece a little bit lower to accommodate for the lower ceiling height. Then I took this leftover strip and I scored along the perpendicular board, then snapped it along that cut line. This is gonna ensure that it's perfectly flush with the piece that I already installed. After confirming fit, I applied the adhesive, pushed it in place, then I used Tyvek tape on the outside corner and then went back and taped the inside corner as well. After installing the rigid foam insulation, we're now ready for the next step, which is framing the basement walls, which will be the next video, and ultimately doing the electrical and installing drywall. What's up guys? In this video, I'm gonna show you how I frame the walls in my basement. This is gonna cover all the basics so that you can eventually run electrical and install drywall for a finished basement if that's what you're going for. Let's get into the video. In the last video, I installed rigid foam insulation. I'll link that video above, but that's typically gonna be done before you frame your walls. Now, when framing a basement wall, you're gonna have the top plate, the bottom plate, and your wall studs. And those wall studs are typically gonna be placed 16 inches on center. The bottom plate is gonna be in contact with your concrete slab, so that needs to be pressure treated, and the top plate can be standard kiln dried lumber. The first step in framing walls is to measure the wall height, which is the distance between the floor slab and the joist above. Measure in a few locations, and the shortest measurement is what you wanna frame your walls to. So if you measure the wall height to be, say, 90 inches between the floor slab and the floor joist above, you're gonna to wanna to cut your studs to 87 inches to make up for the half inch top plate and the half inch bottom plate. So whatever the total wall height is, subtract three inches and that's gonna be your stud length. After cutting your studs to length, you wanna take your top plate and bottom plate and I recommend that you run the tape measure along marking 16 inches on center all the way across. This is by far the fastest way to do it, but I decided to do stick framing, which is where you individually cut the studs after you lift the wall into place in my basement, which was pretty inefficient looking back. Additionally, you wanna make sure that you crown all of your studs, making sure that each board is facing crown up. 
Then I recommend that you use three and a half inch nails and a framing nailer to secure the two outermost studs. Here you can see that I'm using two nails per connection to nail the top plate to the studs. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the bottom plate, which is pressure treated, attaching the studs through the bottom like you're seeing. Next, you're going to lift the wall into place preliminarily. I recommend that you actually mark the wall location on your floor slab using a chalk line. And then when it's in place, you want to secure it to the slab using a carbide tip drill bit to actually drill through the board and into the concrete slab and then using Tapcon screws to secure it in place. After anchoring the bottom, use a level to make sure that the wall is perfectly plumb, and if everything looks good, you can anchor it to your joist above. In this part of my basement, there was a little bit of a bump out, so I took a furring strip and I attached it to the wall by pre-drilling with a carbide tip masonry bit and then using Tapcon screws to anchor it, and then I established a line going from the front of that furring strip to the end of my wall, and then what I'm gonna do is when I frame my wall, the outermost part of that wall is gonna be flush with the furring strip. You'll see what I mean in a second. So right now I'm cutting the bottom plate and the top plate, and then I'm crowning the boards like we did before to make sure everything is crowned up. Then I'm installing the outermost studs, and then I'm gonna nail it in place once everything looks good. And as I mentioned before, I recommend that you put in all the studs before you lift it into place. Don't be like me. Now, as you can see, I have the wall on that chalk line. So basically when I attach the drywall, it'll go into that furring strip and line up perfectly with the wall that we just installed. Now, although I anchored all of my bottom plates to the slab using a carbide tip masonry bit to pre-drill and Tapcon screws, you can also use a powder actuated tool, which is going to use gunpowder to essentially launch a nail through your bottom plate and secure it into the slab. I didn't have one of these, but it would have been a lot faster. So for some reason, I decided to mark my stud spacing and cut my individual studs once the wall was already lifted vertically. I don't know why I chose to do this. It ended up making the process a lot longer, but here I am showing how I installed those after the fact. By custom cutting each stud, positioning it in place 16 inches on center, and then making sure that the studs are perfectly flush with the top plate and bottom plate. And because we cut our walls to the shortest dimension so that they would be able to be lifted into place, you might need to shim before actually anchoring the top plate to the joist above. Here I am moving on to a small sump closet, which is just a closet I'm building around my sump pump, and I'm framing all three of these smaller walls individually. I'm getting the first wall positioned there, and then I'm going to frame up the second smaller wall, and I'm going to position that in place before cutting the final wall, which is going to have the door that I'm going to install later on. Again, with the whole stick framing process, I'm going to add the king studs, the jack studs, etc. for that door later on. Also, use a hammer as needed to move the wall around and manipulate it to get everything plumb and square. At this point, I'm moving on with the stick framing process, and that's cutting each stud individually, positioning it in place between the bottom and the top plate, and then toenailing the studs into the top and bottom plate using the framing nailer. And because these walls aren't supporting any kind of load, I'm going to install framing around the window for the sole purpose of hanging drywall, so it does need to have the jack studs and the support that you typically see for these types of windows. Now because I wasn't the smartest on this project and I didn't mark my 16 inch on center spacing for all of my top and bottom plates before I actually lifted the wall, I'm going back here and I'm marking the bottom plate and now the top plate and then I'm cutting my studs to length after measuring. Then I'm going to crown each of the studs, position them in place, making sure that they are perfectly in line with the 16 inch on center markings. Use a level if you want to check that it's perfectly plumb. Make sure that the front of the stud is flush with the top and bottom plate. And then just like before, we're gonna toenail the stud to the top and bottom plate. Use two nails per connection. Now, if I was doing this again, I would 100% frame the entire wall on the floor, marking the top and bottom plate at 16 inch on center spacing beforehand. And I'd also probably use 16 foot top and bottom plates to make everything go a little faster. Here I am marking the top and bottom plates again, cutting all of my individual studs and then toenailing it in place. This was a pretty redundant process and it took a long time because I didn't do it the right way, which is framing the wall on the ground. So a lot of the same lessons can be applied here with the stick framing approach, but it's by far much less efficient than framing on the ground and lifting it in place. There might be some benefit from framing your doors and windows after lifting the walls in place using stick framing, but honestly, I still think it'd probably be a better bet just to measure everything out and frame it on the ground beforehand. Now, before wrapping up the video, I want to talk a little bit about framing the corners. Now, for the inside corners of this basement, I use something called California Corners, which I didn't show too well on video, but I'm going to show in the model here. So if we remove the top plate, you can see that we're going to go ahead and have a typical stud in the corner that you're always gonna have, but you're also gonna turn one stud sideways and mount it to the inside face of the other stud. This will accomplish two purposes. One, it's gonna allow you to insulate better, and two, it's gonna give you a backing for the drywall or gypsum board you're gonna be installing later on. 
And although this video is about framing walls and not doors, you're gonna need to cut out the bottom plate wherever you have a door in your basement. So hopefully this video gave you some ideas of what to do and what not to do when framing basement walls. What's going on guys? If you're in the process of finishing your basement, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to need to frame around either some HVAC ductwork or some pipes that are suspended below your joists. This video is gonna show you the simplest method, at least in my opinion, on how to frame around HVAC ducts or pipes in a basement. So here's a look at the duct work in my basement before I did anything to it. Obviously it looks really bad and we're going to need to cover this up. In order to frame around this HVAC duct, I used a piece of OSB lumber that I ripped to the correct height and then I had a mounting rail that I attached directly to the floor joist above and then a mounting stud at the bottom of the OSB that's going to serve as the mounting surface for the drywall below. So the first step in this process is to attach the mounting rail to the bottom of the joist so that it runs parallel to the duct. I used a 2x2, two two, but a 2x4 is also fine. After attaching the mounting rail to the bottom side of the floor joist, you're going to want to measure how far that the HVAC duct extends down from the floor joist. So assuming your duct extends 12 inches down from the floor joist, you're going to want to pick up a 4x8 sheet of OSB plywood since it's the least expensive, and you're going to rip it down to a height that is about one inch longer or higher than the duct. That way, when you mount it to the mounting rail, it's gonna extend a little bit lower than the HVAC duct, and you're gonna be able to install plywood below it. Let me show you what I mean. So take your OSB and rip it down to the correct height using a table saw is better. I use a circular saw and a straight edge, and then you're gonna take your two inch by four inch mounting stud, and you're gonna screw it to the bottom. Then as you can see here, I'm positioning it in place and then I'm attaching the top to the mounting rail we installed previously. On the other side, you can see that there's some bends in the HVAC duct, so I had to adjust my mounting rail accordingly to contend for that. The mounting rail again is running parallel to the duct and here's another look at how I had to be creative to get around that corner. As you install the actual OSB to the mounting rail, you wanna use a level to make sure that it's perfectly level on both sides, meaning that the drop is the same height on both sides of the duct. And then you're simply gonna take the OSB with the mounting stud attached to the bottom and attach it to the rail that you installed previously. As mentioned, use a level to make sure you're at the right height on both sides of the duct. Here's a quick look at the mounting stud so you can see exactly how we're gonna attach the drywall to it in the next step. Going around this corner here, what I'm doing now is just doing a dry fit to see how I'm going to need to cut the OSB to size. I'm putting it in place, making sure that I'm perfectly flush with the piece we installed previously. Then I'm going to take my OSB and my 2x4 mounting stud, put it in place. It's helpful to take another piece when you're actually installing it so that it sits properly. And then you're going to screw the OSB into the mounting stud with a few drywall screws. Then I pre-sunk the screw since it was easier, used a level, and then screwed it into place along the mounting rail. After finishing with the framing, you're simply gonna install drywall on the vertical sections directly to the OSB, which is super easy. And then for the drywall at the bottom, you're just gonna attach it to the mounting studs on both sides of the duct. Next, it's simply a matter of cutting out the penetrations for your vents and finishing the drywall with corner bead and joint compound. Although this OSB method is my favorite, there's also other methods of framing around ductwork, like what you're seeing here, which is just some metal studs attached every 16 inches on center, and you can mount the drywall to that, just like you would for any wall. You can also use this method around pipes, which is what I had to do in this location here. In the next video, we're gonna install electrical in preparation for the drywall installation. What's up guys? So if you're in the process of planning out finishing your basement, you probably thought about how you're gonna take electricity and run it to your basement. Now this video is gonna cover everything that I did to run electricity in my basement. It's gonna cover the planning process, how to run your electrical outlets, how to run your recess lighting, general layouts, kind of how to establish your home runs back to the electrical panel, just some general tips and tricks for how I did it. Not how you should do it, but how I did it. Let's get into the video. So before we can actually add electricity, we have to insulate and frame the basement, which I did in the last two videos. So after framing the basement, it was time for electrical. And the first thing I did is I marked 16 inches off the floor with a chalk line. This is gonna indicate the bottom of the outlets. And then I also marked 24 inches off the floor, which is gonna be where I drill the holes where I'm gonna run the wire above the outlets. I'm gonna be running 12-2 Romex cable. So I'm drilling half inch holes through all of my studs. I'm gonna link the 12-2 Romex cable down in the video description, as well as all the other products and materials I use for this project. Now, before we go any further, a quick disclaimer, I am not an electrician, I'm a DIY guy and a professional sign spinner. So you should absolutely not listen to what I say. Take this for entertainment purposes only and consult a licensed electrician and probably have them perform it 
for any electricity in your house. You can see here that I'm running it a little bit closer to the wall since it's an exterior wall, but typically you want to drill right through the middle of your studs. After marking the outlet height, you're going to position the outlet box in place and there's tabs on the side of the outlet to make sure that you're a half inch in front of the stud. That way, when you install the drywall later, it's going to be flush with that receptacle box. I'm going through, making sure we're flush with the line, making sure that it's positioned on those tabs, and then I'm tapping them in with the provided nails. Also, I like to remove the tabs before I actually install the receptacle box. So before we go further, I want to give you a quick rundown on the electrical layout in my basement so you understand what we're installing and where we're installing it. Okay, so I sketched up real quick a wiring diagram in my basement. Basically, when you come down the stairs, you have your first switch right here. That's what that symbol is and that controls these four recessed lights in the ceiling. And then all of these are outlet receptacles all around the room. I then have another switch up here that controls these six lights. And then another switch right here on the inside of the bedroom that controls all of the overhead recessed lights in this room. Then in the bathroom, we have a couple of overhead recessed lights and then we have our exhaust fan right here, as well as a junction box for an LED mirror that we're gonna be installing. When positioning outlets, you might have heard something called the 612 rule. Basically, you need to have an outlet within six feet of kind of any wall. So in between two outlets in a long run, you have six feet on either side, so you can have a 12 foot span, but you need to make sure that within six feet around corners, you have an outlet receptacle. Do some research on the 612 rule, and you can see what I mean, and consult the local codes in your area. So after spacing all of our receptacle boxes according to the 612 rule, I started to run my 12-tube Romex cable, and basically I'm just running it from one box to the next. I'm gonna run power from the electrical panel to that first receptacle in just a minute, but for now, I'm just gonna run Romex from one box to the next until every single receptacle box that's part of that circuit is connected with Romex cable. So as I run from one outlet box or gang box to the other, you can see that I installed the protective plates to protect the wire every time that it crossed a stud. This is a requirement per code in a lot of areas. And I also trimmed off the excess cable and wire that was coming out. You really only need about six or eight inches coming out of the box. Also, be sure to tuck your cable back within the box so it doesn't get in the way when you install drywall. Now, a quick note about cable staples. You need to install those six inches from each electrical box and every few feet along your run, depending on the code requirement. So let's move away from outlets and talk about recessed lighting real quick. I went with these commercial electric LED lights. They're slim, and honestly, they're a little bit more expensive, but I think the installation ease makes it well worth it. So this basically comes with the slim light right here, which basically has the clips on it, as you can see, and these just clip into place and go up in your ceiling. And they have the mounting box right here, which you just fasten, and then these come together. Let me show you. And then essentially you have your mounting box and then once you actually run the electrical, all you have to do is thread the connection here and then it fits in nice and easy like that. And then you go back through and you just tighten this thing up. These things work pretty good. I highly recommend them a little more pricey, but they're super easy to install. So after planning out and establishing my recessed lighting layout, I took the mounting boxes and I installed them in the general location of where I'm actually gonna install the lights. I'm gonna put the lights through the actual drop ceiling panels later on, and you'll see that in a minute. And I use this LED mounting frame just for some temporary lighting, but if you're installing drywall, you might need these by code. And here's a look at the mounting box installed with the incoming and outgoing 12-2 Romex. So real quick, let's go back to the whiteboard. I wanna show you the home runs, which are the circuits that go directly back to the electrical panel. Let me show you what I mean. One other thing to note is basically electrical home runs, which are the runs that go directly from a circuit all the way back to your electrical panel. So I added a new circuit for each of the rooms in my basement. The first one here is going from the electrical panel and that's powering basically the outlet here that controls my TV and my electric fireplace, as well as a switch here and all the receptacles on this wall. So basically everything from here down is controlled by this one circuit. Then I have a dedicated circuit for the bathroom here. Then we have our third circuit right here, which goes to the bedroom. So that includes the switch, all the receptacles here and all the overhead lights in that room. And then finally, we have our fourth circuit, which is going back to the electrical panel, which controls this room, the switch, all the overhead lights and all the receptacles, as well as a sump pump over here. So consider using one dedicated circuit for each room in your basement. That's what I did and I think it's a good approach, but obviously check your building codes and do what's best for your situation. Okay, so I wanted just to run through some electrical for this bathroom in the basement. So started with our board and then we're running all of our new cables um, along the joist right there. Now, something to note is that because we're using a drop ceiling, we can install them like this. Otherwise, you would wanna run them through the joists like that. So 
Let's start over on this side. So we have our panel and we have our first new circuit. So we're going into the switch there and that's gonna control all of the recessed lighting in that area. And then I also have it feeding the receptacles in that area as well. And then we have our second 20 amp GFCI protected circuit for the bathroom. Most codes require that the bathroom has its own dedicated circuit anyway. And you can see we have that running down and we're gonna run this into the bathroom. We have our stud protectors and that's gonna power a GFCI outlet as well as the LED mirror, the recessed lighting and the overhead exhaust fan in that room. So at this point, I think you get the picture. Let's install the drywall and then we can talk about the finished electrical work. So I'm gonna have a dedicated video going through the drywall process, but I think a routing tool is the best way to cut around your actual electrical boxes, but I'll release that video in a little bit. So in my opinion, the rough electrical work is so much harder than the finished electrical. So really after you put the drywall in, it's as simple as just wiring up our outlets and our switches. And you can never be too careful with electrical. So I always use my Kuwait's voltage tester and make sure that the breaker's off before doing any of this finished electrical work. So I'm not gonna go into the details of wiring a switch, but I installed dimmer switches throughout most of my basement. I'll link those products in the description if you wanna check those out. And then you're gonna put on the face plates. And I installed a GFCI outlet as the first outlet in my electrical run. And then here's a quick way to actually strip those wires for your outlets. This is a Kuwait's wire stripper. It makes it really quick, but traditional wire strippers work just fine as well. So whenever I wire an outlet, you're first gonna pigtail the ground since you can only have one ground wire going to your outlet. Then I bend the ends of all of the wires in a clockwise direction. I thread the black to the brass, always threading clockwise. And then I'm tightening up with a drill, which you really shouldn't do. You should use a screwdriver. Here I am making the final connection with the ground wire. And then I'm gonna tighten everything up, put it in place and get it fixed to the wall before putting on the faceplate. There are plenty of videos on YouTube showing how to wire an outlet. So this is just the basic overview. For my entertainment center, I'm gonna have a wall-mounted TV as well as an electric fireplace. So I installed some dedicated outlets for that. Then once I actually attach the fireplace to my entertainment center wall, I just had to plug it in and this wire is tucked out of the way in a closet so it's not gonna be a problem. Because my LED bathroom mirror was between two studs, I installed the drywall and then cut out the gang box with a drywall saw very carefully. This electrical box is for existing construction because it has fins that will allow it to mount directly in the middle of drywall. Then I installed the LED light in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. Now, if you're installing drywall for your ceiling, you're gonna need to install these LED mounting frames like I alluded to earlier. Those are the clips that you're gonna position in place, thread in the wire, and then put those clips on the inside and it's gonna hold your LED light flush. But because I installed a drop ceiling, I was able to install those LED lights in the middle of the actual drop ceiling panels. And I just cut those out using some snippers like you're seeing to the right diameter, installed those in place, wired up the light, and then attached it to the drop ceiling panel. Here's a look at me testing that one light I installed, and here are four of the lights installed before I finished in the rest of the panels. The last thing to do was install this exhaust fan, and I'm gonna have a dedicated video for that in the future. Now, I 100% recognize that plenty of you watching this video know more about electricity than me, so drop your comments down below. Please keep them helpful for other people who are trying to finish their basement. What's up everybody? If you're thinking about installing drywall in your basement on your own, I have one piece of advice for you. Do not do it. But if you're like me a few months ago and you're stubborn and want to do it on your own for that personal satisfaction, here are my best tips and tricks for getting a good drywall installation in your basement. Let's get into it. So in the last couple of videos of the basement finishing series, we installed rigid foam insulation, we framed the walls, and then we installed electrical. So now we're all teed up to start installing the drywall. So the previous owners of this house did a little bit of framing with metal studs. So what I'm doing right now is installing the drywall on the metal stud sections. And the only difference for installing drywall on metal studs is you need a self-tapping drywall screw. And this is gonna basically make sure that you're able to secure the drywall to the metal studs. Secure the drywall with screws every 16 inches on center, but some people will even secure it every eight inches on center. Just don't skimp on the screws. Also note the drywall comes in various thicknesses, but I used half inch drywall for all the drywall in my basement. As you can see here, I had to do a creative cut at the top there to contend with the HVAC soffit, and then we're securing it just like we did before. I'm gonna cover how to cut drywall and all of that in a few minutes. Also, you'll see here that this drywall is green. I got a lot of this drywall from a buddy of mine who finished a basement and had a lot of leftovers. The green drywall is just mold resistant drywall, so I used that wherever I could. Here I am noting the general location for that electrical box, and then I hung the drywall at the top and used a router to actually scribe around the electrical box. They make a specific tool for cutting around electrical boxes, and I'll link that in the video description. 
So I installed the first sheets vertically and now I'm moving on to horizontal. I don't know why I went back and forth. I should have probably found one orientation and stuck with it, but I had my brother help me lift that first one and then I installed the second one, cut around the receptacle box there. And then there's a window here. And what I did is I just hung the drywall over the window and then I went back later with a utility knife and a straight edge to cut around the window framing. One thing to note real quick, you're always gonna wanna install a drywall on the ceiling first, but because I installed a drop ceiling in my basement, I didn't have to worry about installing drywall on the ceiling. I just had to do the walls. If you're hanging drywall on your own, you can mark four foot and a quarter inch from the top of where you want the drywall to hang and you can install some temporary screws. Here's a look at that, installed at four foot and a quarter inches and then four foot and a quarter inches on the other side. That way you can lift the board horizontally, rest it in place on those screws, make any adjustments and then once everything looks good, you can actually attach the drywall every 16 inches on center. After hanging the sheet of drywall, I cut around the receptacle box and then I cut out the window. This time I used a drywall saw to actually cut this one out and I got a better result. Moving on to the bottom here, you can see that I have a tool right there that's gonna allow me to lift the drywall up so that it's perfectly flush with the drywall above. I'll link that tool in the description. It's pretty low tech. And for any drywall job, you're obviously gonna need to know how to cut the drywall. Fortunately, they make a drywall straight edge that hooks on the edge of the drywall and then you simply need to take a utility knife and score along the paper of the drywall. Then it simply snaps right along that scored line really easily. Then just take a utility knife on the opposite side and cut the piece free. They make something called a drywall rasp, which you can use to clean up the edges. But honestly, unless the edges are really bad, you probably don't need it. But honestly, I'm really not all that good at drywall. So maybe a rasp was exactly what I needed more of. So after cutting that piece of drywall to the correct length, I just installed it every 16 inches on center maximum, and you can do eight inches on center as the minimum spacing. So here I am cutting the bottom piece below the piece we just installed. And as you can see, scribing it, cutting it along the line of paper, and then putting it in place. What I'm doing here is I'm just drawing the location of the outlet box. I usually just write that on the piece of drywall. Then I installed it in place, took the measurement and transcribed the bottom right corner of where I can find that electrical box. Usually I'll just scribe around a spare electrical box to get a general idea of where I'm gonna be running this and then use your router or roto zip to go counterclockwise around the box that you marked. I then finished installing the drywall screws around the box. Also, you wanna install your drywall screws so that they're just slightly recessed into the drywall. You don't want them sticking out. And I installed a sheet of mold resistant drywall near the door since I thought it would experience a little more moisture being by the door. And then I marked the location of the switch box and then scribed that out the same way we've done with all the rest with the router tool. You can use a drywall saw for this, but the moral of the story is you don't wanna damage the wires on the inside of the box. So be careful of those. Now, let me show you how I drywalled around the window. I started by cutting the top piece of the window out to the correct size. And this is so it would butt up flush against the window trim and so that it would also be perfectly in line with the drywall that made up the wall. Once everything looked good, I secured it in place and that gap at the back, we're gonna fill with quarter round later. For the sides, I cut it to the right height and I left it a little bit long so that I could scribe along the face of the drywall. And then I simply scored along that line and cut it in place. That way, when I stuck the piece of drywall back in the window well, it was perfectly flush with the front of the wall. I secured it in place after everything looked good and then I moved on to the final wall. I measured the height. Again, I cut it a little bit long, put it in place, and then I'm gonna scribe where it meets the face of that wall there. Running the utility knife along the line, snapping it in place, cutting the paper on the opposite side, and then securing it in place. Just like before, you want the drywall screws to be slightly recessed into the paper. So based on the way I framed around my HVAC ductwork, I was able to attach the vertical section of drywall directly to the OSB. I'll link that framing video above so you can see exactly how I did that. And then underneath the duct, I simply attached the drywall to the mounting studs that are on either side of the duct. This was the perfect height for me to use my head as a third arm to hold it in place. And I had to cut a notch out for that support post in the middle there. As you can see, I let the drywall be a little bit long and then I scribed it to the right length and snapped it off after it was installed in place. Here you can see that it was a little bit of some creative geometry. I installed a large piece and then I used the utility knife to scribe around that 90 degree bend in the ductwork. Then I used a router to cut out the vents. Okay, so now that we've hung the drywall, it's time to go Daniel Craig on them and get our knives out. Drywall.
So the first step in finishing drywall is we're gonna take some joint compound and a six inch drywall knife and we're gonna apply the compound to the seam between drywall sheets. I like to take my putty knife sideways and just apply a good layer of the compound. Then I like to find the middle of the seam within the compound using my knife by turning it sideways. Then you're gonna take some drywall tape and apply it down the middle of the seam. Use your hand to kind of push it in place and then you're gonna cut off any excess by putting your drywall knife against it and just ripping along the knife. Then you wanna get out any of the excess drywall mud, but also leave a good layer of the mud on top of the tape. Now again, I'm not a pro at this, but the first step in finishing drywall is just to put the tape over the seams for all of the drywall in your application area. And here I am repeating this process for a vertical seam between drywall sheets. I'm gonna apply a thin layer of compound to the seam. Then I'm gonna take a piece of tape and apply it down the center of the seam. Next, remove any of the excess joint compound and try not to have any abrupt edges or lumps. The smoother it is now, the less sanding you'll have to do in the future. Repeat this process for all the drywall seams that are in your basement. Additionally, as part of the first taping coat, you wanna apply a layer of mud over each of the screw holes. For inside corners, you're still gonna use drywall tape, except the tape has a crease down the middle. What you're gonna do for the inside corners is just fold the tape along that crease to get a 90 degree angle like you're seeing here. Then you're gonna apply mud to the corner, stick the crease tape at the 90 degree angle within the inside corner, and then apply a little bit more of the mud. Let me show you what I mean. So for this inside corner, I'm applying a little bit of the joint compound to both sides of the corner. Then I'm creasing the tape down the middle to get a 90 degree angle, pushing the tape into the corner, and then smoothing out any of the excess joint compound. So although drywall tape can be used on inside corners, outside corners require something called corner bead. There's a bunch of different types of corner bead, but for my drywall project in my basement, I went with paper face corner bead, which I basically just install right over top of the corners and it gives you a nice smooth transition from one side to the next. So for this outside corner, I'm applying joint compound to both sides of the corner. Then I'm taking my corner bead, I'm cutting it to the appropriate height, pressing it into the joint compound, and then I'm removing any excess from behind the bead. Here I am showing how I got the length for the windows. Then I used some snippers to cut the corner bead to the right height. Then I repeated this measuring and cutting process for the top of the window and the other side. Then I applied joint compound to all of the surfaces, positioned and pushed the corner bead into place, and then then I removed any of the excess joint compound with a putty knife. Again, try to make it as smooth as possible to minimize the sanding you're gonna have to do later. In my basement, I had to install a lot of corner bead around the soffit drop, around all of the outside corners. It was a lot of work. This is one of the reasons why hiring it out might be the best bet. It really did take a lot of time for me to complete this. So after taping all the seams, inside corners and outside corners with corner bead, here's what your basement will look like. So after installing the tape with our six inch knife, the drywall finishing process is basically just to use two more passes of a drywall knife to feather out the edge and make it less noticeable. So you start with a six inch for the tape, then you're gonna use either a 10 inch or an eight inch knife to go a little bit wider than the initial six inch. And then finally, you're gonna come in with a 12 inch knife to make it even a little bit wider. The goal here is just to apply a couple coats of the drywall mud to make the joint as inconspicuous as possible. There's a lot of really great videos on YouTube that go into the drywall finishing process. And because I'm not a pro, I'm not gonna show you how I did it because there's better instruction out there. I just wanna give you the overview of the process. So as I mentioned, here I am taking a pass with the 10 inch knife. I'm gonna feather out the initial six inch pass. Then I let that dry overnight, came back and did the 12 inch pass. And after that dried, it was time to sand everything down. Obviously wear a respirator for this. I'm using a 120 grit sanding screen to sand everything down and get it smooth. And although this is a time lapse, this was a pretty iterative process. I ended up having to go back and apply a little bit more mud in a few locations. It's just a pain in the butt. And if you're not a pro at drywall, this is gonna take you a long time, which is why I said it's probably not worth it. You could probably have a company come in here, knock this out in a fraction of the time and probably only for a couple thousand dollars, which is probably worth it. Another drawback of being a DIY drywaller is you're probably gonna do so much more sanding than a professional would, which is gonna result in a lot of dust and a lot of mess, which is another pain in the butt to have to contend with. And finally, after vacuuming up all of the remaining drywall dust, all that was left to do was to prime the walls and then I did one coat of paint to give us the final result that you're seeing now.
Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this video helped you out. And if it did, please drop a like down below and subscribe to the channel if you want to see how I installed the LVP flooring and how I installed the drop ceiling, which will be the next two videos in the basement finishing series. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one. What's up guys? In this video, I'm gonna show you how to replace a basement window so that you can take old, nasty, or even broken windows and turn them into this. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to remove the existing window, how to clean up the rough and opening, how to install the new window, how to insulate around it, and finally, how to make the final touches on the exterior. And I'm also gonna show you how to trim out the interior for a finished basement look. Let's get into it. So when I bought this fixer upper property, the existing windows were in pretty bad shape. They're the steel type that's cast into the actual concrete foundation. And the first step in actually getting these out was to remove the glass insert. And I just got this out of the way so I wasn't dealing with glass. You might have to use a little bit of elbow grease to actually remove these, but with a little bit of wiggling back and forth, it wasn't too bad. So after getting the glass panels out, here's a look at the perimeter of the window. As you can see, it's made of metal and it's basically cast into the sides and bottom of the concrete foundation, which is great when it's installed, but it's a little bit of a pain to actually remove it in the future. So after fumbling my way through the first two windows, I finally found out the secret, at least in my opinion, which is to cut the top center of the window. And once you cut that with a sawzall equipped with a metal blade, you'll be able to pry the sides out of place. At least I was. Use a pry bar to get both of the sides relatively loose. And once those are loose, you can start working on the bottom. You're basically gonna just pull and pry, use a pry bar as needed and get that loose. But I found that after you wiggle it back and forth enough, it'll kind of free itself from the concrete that it was cast in and you'll be able to lift the entire window assembly out of place. After removing the existing window, use a vacuum to get rid of any dirt, dust or debris that was left in place. Here's a look at the window. Not super pretty, but we'll clean that up in a minute. Now, finding suitable replacement windows for the old basement windows can be a bit of a challenge, but you just need to find something that's gonna be slightly smaller than the existing rough opening in terms of length and height. So the replacement basement windows I found have these mounting flanges on the perimeter, but since those are for new construction, we're gonna use a utility knife and snippers to cut those off. It really wasn't hard, just score along the window, cut the sides, and then you'll be able to bend them over and snap them off pretty easily. simple as that. After removing those mounting flanges, I took the window and I preliminarily positioned it in place within the rough opening just to get an idea of how it was looking. Next, you want to use some shims to space around the top sides and bottom of the window so that there's an even gap on all of the sides. After putting in the first couple shims, use a level to make sure the window is perfectly plumb and then check to make sure it's perfectly level. Make any adjustments, add additional shims, remove shims as necessary, and try to get the even spacing around the entire perimeter and also make sure that your window is level and plumb. Once you're happy with how the window is sitting in place, you're going to take some window and door spray foam insulation and you're gonna spray it in the gap between the window and the concrete foundation. You want to spray enough insulation so that you don't have a draft going around the window, but try to minimize overspray because you're gonna have to go back later on and cut off all the excess. Continue to apply spray foam insulation to all the gaps on the exterior of the window, and then I recommend that you go to the interior side of the window and continue to apply spray foam insulation to ensure that you don't have any air gaps between the window and the window's rough and frame. I was filming as I applied this, so it doesn't look super great and I have a lot of overspray and I had to go back and fill in some areas, but hopefully you get the picture and if you're doing it without a camera, it'll hopefully go a little bit smoother. So a quick note is that some windows have penetrations where you can screw through the window and into the foundation or into the framing above. Mine didn't, and from the research I did online, I found that that spray foam insulation, when you apply enough of it, it's gonna hold that window in nice and snugly, especially once we put in the concrete on the outside and caulk it in place. I've had these windows installed for over a year now and haven't had any problems, but if you want that extra security, look at ways to screw through the window into the foundation. After giving the spray foam a couple hours just to fully cure and harden, I took a utility knife and I scored and snapped the shims in place. And then I took a longer utility knife to cut off the excess spray foam by running it along the window to cut off any of the overspray. As you can see here, there was a lot of excess spray foam insulation, which was a result of me being a little heavy handed on the spray foam insulation trigger, which is a lesson learned for next time. Here's a look at the spray foam that was removed on the inside of the window. Not perfect, but most of the excess was taken care of. 
And if your basement is unfinished and you were just replacing a broken window, you can honestly stop here on the inside. But on the outside, you're gonna wanna mix up some rapid setting concrete and make any repairs to the foundation along the bottom. As you can see here, we had a little bit of a bigger gap along the bottom of the window, which I filled in with the concrete there, and then I painted it to match the rest of the foundation. Then for the rest of the gaps on the sides and top, you're gonna use a high quality exterior sealant to seal around the window. And after caulking, you should have a window that looks like this. After finishing on the exterior, now we're going to trim out the inside of the window so that you can get a finished basement look like this. Let's get into it. So here's where this project starts. As you can see, we already framed the walls and we installed the drywall in the basement. I have videos for both those projects if you want to check them out. But the big thing to note here is that I framed the walls so that they were perfectly in line with the cinder block rough in opening. And then I put the bottom of the windowsill framing so that when I put the windowsill on top of it, it's gonna contact the bottom of the window. You'll see what I mean in a minute. So taking the drywall, I'm cutting it to size with a utility knife. And as you can see here, I'm fitting it on the top so that it contacts the window and that it's flush with the front of that framing there. After installing that top piece of drywall, we're gonna cut the drywall for the side. So get your measurement from the drywall at the top to the windowsill there, and then cut the drywall to size using a utility knife and a straight edge. For more information on how to cut and install drywall, you can check out my drywall installation tips video. So as you can see here, I cut the drywall to the right height, but I left it a little bit long, and then I'm gonna push it all the way in so that it's contacting the side of the window, as you can see, and then I'm gonna take a utility knife to score it along the face of the drywall so that it's perfectly flush with the wall, and then snap it and cut the other side of the paper. After cutting it to the right size, I used a few drywall screws and fastened it to the framing. I put about four or five screws per side of drywall. Then I repeated this process for the other side, scoring and snapping the drywall to the right size and making sure that it's perfectly flush all the way around as you can see. A quick note is that this drywall method of trimming around a window is kind of a cheap and expensive way to get around the traditional window boxes that are made of solid wood that you can buy. This is again just one way you can do it. It's a little bit cheaper than buying the actual window box, but as a rental project, this is fine for my basement. Next up, we're gonna get the length and width dimensions for our window sill. As you can see, from the window to the edge of the drywall, we're looking at about seven inches, and here I'm gonna get the actual length. And keep in mind, I'm gonna have an overhang of about three inches on either side of the window, and you'll see what I mean in just a second. For my window sill, I'm using a one by 10 and I ripped it down to about 8 inches so that we have it about an inch longer than the depth of the window. Then I cut it to the right length and that length is the window length plus 6 inches because I'm going to have this 3 inch overhang on both sides of the window which I'm scribing out now. So what I'm showing here is we're going to cut out that larger segment at the back and then that little part on the front is going to overhang the window and contact the drywall when we insert this windowsill into place. You'll see what I mean in just a second. But first, I'm taking a router with a three quarter inch roundover bit, and I'm just giving the edge of the windowsill a rounded edge. Although this isn't necessary, I think it gives it a much more professional look. After giving the edges of the sill a rounded look, I took my jigsaw and I cut out the penetrations. After cutting these out, you're gonna have that three inch lip on both sides of the window. And then I used some 120 grit sandpaper on my orbital sander to make everything smooth. After sanding it down, it's time to do a test fit. Let's see how we did. Not bad, it slid in there perfectly, it's contacting the drywall, and it's also contacting the back of the window there. Not bad for the first one. So after cutting out the first window sill, I repeated this process for the other three windows in my basement. That's rounding over the edge, cutting out the penetrations, and then smoothing everything down with an orbital sander. But here is where I made a big mistake. I cut my window sill to length based on the unfinished dimensions of the window. So when I actually went back and finished around the outside corners of the window by adding the corner bead and the drywall mud, I added about a quarter of an inch thickness on both sides. And as you can imagine, that extra thickness made it too tight of a fit for that original window sill to fit and I had to trim it down which took a little bit of time it wasn't a big deal I was able to go back in and trim it to the right size but it's a lesson learned that hopefully you can avoid on your project so after finishing the drywall around the window outside corners you're gonna go back and caulk the seam between the window and the drywall and then I decided to paint my window sills white in hindsight probably should have kept the wood look but you live and you learn and after ruining, I mean painting the window sills, I applied some liquid nails to the rough opening window sill, and then I took the finished window sill and put it on top, contacting the liquid nails and pushing it down in place. Then you're gonna use a level to make sure that you're both level across left to right, 
and also level front to back. And after everything looks good, take a brad nailer and nail the windowsill to the rough framing below. And for the sake of full transparency, three of my windows went perfect. One of them had this gap at the top. I don't know if I mismeasured or what, but I filled that in with some quarter round that I glued and then nailed in place with brad nails. And at this point, I simply repeated the windowsill installation process for the rest of the windows in my basement. And again, that's liquid nails, install the sill, check for level, and then nail it in place. And for this slight gap underneath the windowsill, I applied caulk just like I did for the sides of the window. Sorry I didn't show that on camera. At this point, you've successfully trimmed out your window. Here's a quick reminder of where we started. And here's a look at the final result. Again, this is just one way to trim out a window. It's how I did it. It's not necessarily how you should do it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Let's get into the video. So the first step is obviously just to remove any dirt or debris by sweeping it up, but here's a preview of the other steps in the project. We're gonna cover all of these steps in detail within the video, but let's start by preparing the room for LVP installation. So after sweeping, I applied some disinfectant to the floor with a mop just to kill everything. And before you can actually install LVP, you need to make sure that the floor is perfectly flat. And perfect, according to Metro Floor, means that the concrete needs to be flat within 3 16ths of an inch over a 10 foot radius. Basically, you can't have any abrupt height differences between the floor or else it's not gonna sit properly. My basement was pretty flat all the way throughout except for one section, and for this section, I had to apply a self-leveling underlayment, which you basically are just going to mix up, apply a primer, and then let it kind of level out on its own. After applying a self-leveling underlayment, give it a few days to make sure all the moisture evaporates. I'll have a dedicated video for this later on. And lastly, you want to make sure there's no water infiltrating up through the slab. Water is a no-no under the LVP, so follow the manufacturer's instructions on the maximum moisture levels that can be present in the slab. And finally, if you're doing this in an existing room, you might need to remove existing carpet or flooring and remove the baseboards. Do that now. Next up, we're gonna position spacers around the room. Because LVP is a floating floor, it needs to expand and contract freely. So you wanna maintain a quarter inch expansion gap around the entire room. And I got these spacers from an LVP installation kit, which I'll link in the description. And I decided to install a glass shower door since I... Like almost every project, a good LVP flooring installation starts with planning. As a rule of thumb, you wanna have a six inch stagger at each end joint, and that's illustrated here. Sometimes you might need to trim on one side of the room to get that minimum of six inches on the other side. Another rule of thumb is you don't wanna have a small sliver at the end of a row. So if you find yourself in a position where if you start with a full LVP tile on one side and you end up with a sliver on the other, you're gonna to wanna to cut some of that first one to make the end one longer. You can check out my blog if you want more information on the planning process and also check out the resources Metro Floor has so that you can plan a layout that works for your room. Now at this point, we can install the first row of LVP. For my basement renovation project, I use Metro Floor's Engage Inception product line. And honestly, it was super easy to install. It's waterproof, it has a lifetime residential warranty, and my favorite part is it comes with an underlayment on the bottom because for my LVP upstairs, I didn't have the attached underlayment and installing that separately is a pain in the butt. I'll link Metro Floor's products down in the description. Start with the groove edge facing towards the middle of the room and the tongue edge facing the wall. Here's a look at the groove edge and here's a look at the tongue edge. And the tongue edge will interlock with the groove edge as shown to give you a waterproof and solid interlocking mechanism. So for the second piece, I'm taking the tongue, inserting it into the groove and letting it interlock. Now for the next piece, you're gonna insert the long edge first and then the short end is gonna overlap the previous board. Then use a rubber mallet to interlock those two boards along the short edge. The manufacturer recommends that you install LVP in kind of this stair step one, two, three, four pattern, but I personally like to do one full row and then just go and do the next row. As you can see here, I'm interlocking the long edge first and then the short edge and then using a rubber face mallet to interlock the short edge. The beauty of LVP is that it's very redundant and once you have this process down of interlocking the long edge and then the short edge, you're just gonna repeat this process over and over again. At the end of the row here, I need to make a small cut on the end and to cut LVP, you're gonna take a carpenter square and a utility knife to score the face of the LVP and then you're gonna snap it along the scored line. Then flip the board over and cut the underlayment. For cuts that are that small, you might wanna use a miter saw to make it easier, but that's why I had to use pliers to get the leverage to actually snap it along the scored line. 
After completing the first two rows, I had to make my first creative cut to get around the door jam there. And to do that, I used a carpenter square to mark the geometry. This is just going to be a small notch that I need to cut out. And for cuts like this, I highly recommend that you use a jigsaw. Based on my experience, this is by far the best tool for the job. After cutting that piece, I positioned it in place, and I'm going to be installing an LVP transition in the middle of that door threshold there, which I'm going to show a little bit later. Then I'm just continuing on with that row, interlocking the tongue edge with the groove edge, and then just like before, I'm going to interlock the short joint with a rubber mallet. As I install this row, I want to mention that there's a tapping block that comes with the LVP installation kit that's going to help you to make sure that your interlocks are perfect. As we get to the other side of the door, here's the second notch we're going to have to cut out. And after making that cut, we position it in place just like before, interlocking the tongue into the groove and sliding it right in there. As we get to the end of this row, I want to demonstrate one more time how to cut the final piece of LVP to length. What I usually do is I take a tape measure and I make a measurement maintaining a quarter inch gap at the wall. And then I measure to the end of the short joint. You can also just position a board in place and mark it that way, but make sure that you flip the board around so that the tongue is always interlocking with the groove. After marking the line, use your carpenter square as a straight edge and then score along the face of the LVP. I had to flip my square around because it wasn't long enough, but I really should have just gone out and purchased a larger square. Next, flip the LVP over and snap it along the scored line and then take your utility knife and cut the underlayment. That's the easiest way to cut it, in my opinion. Now, install the short piece just like before and use a tapping block to interlock everything perfectly. Now, if you guys are okay with it, I'm going to time lapse through the last few rows until we get to the final row of LVP, where we're going to need to rip it down widthwise to make it fit. So as we get to the last row, I always like to vacuum up because usually if there's any dust, I just push it to the end. And then I'm measuring here the width we're going to need for that final row. Next, I'm going to go ahead and transpose that measurement onto my piece of LVP. I'm going to use another board as a straight edge to mark it. And then you're simply going to cut the LVP to the correct width using a circular saw. Make sure you adjust the saw cut depth and put a piece of cardboard or protection underneath to protect your blade. After cutting it to the right width, install it in place and use a pull bar that came with the LVP floor installation kit to pull everything tight and get it interlocked the way it should be. So at this point, we've completed the first room in the basement and now I have to move on and apply LVP to the second room. But what I did is I used a laser level to make sure that the planks in each room were gonna line up along the seam. Let me show you what I mean. So as you can see, I'm using this laser level to establish the starting line for the first row of LVP in the next room. And then I snapped the chalk line so I didn't have to worry about bumping that laser level. Now that I have my starting line, we can start to lay the first row of planks. As you can see here, I'm gonna have to cut a notch around that closet, both there and in the corner. And then I measured and marked the cutouts with a Sharpie before cutting them out with my jigsaw. After cutting out those notches, I positioned the first piece of LVP in place, made sure that it was lined up with the chalk line we snapped, and then I continued with the installation process. As you can see here towards the end, I'm gonna score and snap this last piece so that it lines up perfectly with that transition molding that we're gonna install in between the door threshold. And then I simply continued on with the installation process up towards the door. These couple rows were tough because I was basically going backwards, inserting the groove end into the tongue, but with a little bit of patience, you can make it work. And then for these last rows, I had to use the pull bar, obviously, to get the interlock. Once I finished that row, I got some help for these remaining rows, which made it go by super fast. Now we have this support column in the middle of the basement here, and this is where you need to measure beforehand because you need to ensure that you're gonna land in the middle between two planks, because if you land in the center of a board, you're never gonna be able to get that on there. So to mark this cutout, I had this roll of tape that was just about the same diameter as that support column. So I marked that and then I used my jigsaw just like before to cut that out. After getting that half circle cut out on the first board, I positioned it in place around the pole and got everything interlocked. As you can see, a pretty good fit. And then I finished out that row so I could cut out the other half circle for the other side of that support column. So again, I marked it the exact same way, cut it out with my jigsaw, and then I positioned it in place around the pole. Overall, it was a pretty good fit. Obviously, you're going to have a slight gap between the pole and the LVP, and to seal that up, I just used some caulk. So after we got through the support column, it was really just a matter of plugging and chugging until we got to the end here, inserting the tongue into the groove and continuing all the way, making sure that all of our edges are interlocking properly. Now at this point, I'm measuring for the last row. And to be honest with you, this last row is a lot thinner than I would like, but because of where the support column landed in the basement, we had to make do with this. In a perfect world, you would cut a little bit off of the first row and then you would split the difference between this row and that row. But 
This is about four inches or so, so we can make it work. I'm installing this last row here, and obviously for the last row, you're gonna need to use the pull bar to get it to interlock properly. To install the transition moldings, you're first going to measure how long it needs to be, and then you're going to cut the aluminum track to size using a miter saw. To transition between the two rooms, I'm using a T molding since the floor is at the same height in both rooms, and you're just going to cut the T molding to the correct length. Next, position the mounting track in place and mark the screw locations. And because we're on a slab, we need a hammer drill and a carbide tip masonry bit to drill into the concrete. Insert the concrete screw anchors into the holes you pre-drilled, and these came with Metro Floors transition moldings, and you're going to do this for all the holes that you pre-drilled. Next, I use some adhesive and I position the track in place before screwing it down. Then you're gonna take your team molding and it's gonna snap right into the track and use a hammer to make sure it snaps properly. Over here at the door, I'm gonna install another transition, but this is gonna be an end cap since it's where the flooring is gonna end. Just like before, we're gonna cut the transition molding and the track to the right length, then pre-drill your holes and insert the screw anchors just like before. Then use some adhesive, push the track into place and screw it in just like we did for the T-molding. And finally, I'm measuring the width for that last piece of LVP, ripping it down to size, inserting it in place, interlocking it with the other board and using the pull bar to make sure it interlocks properly. And just like for the T-molding, you're gonna take your end cap molding and press it into place within the track, making sure that it snaps into place properly. And as a final touch, I ran a bead of caulk between the threshold and that transition molding. Here's how it looks. And at this point, all there's left to do is install the baseboards. So I identify the studs using a stud finder, and then I attach the baseboards to the studs every 16 inches on center using a brad nailer. And this is gonna cover up that quarter inch expansion gap all around the room. Now let's take a quick reminder look of where we started. And here's a look at the final result. What's up everybody? In today's project, I'm going to show you how to install an Armstrong drop ceiling in a basement. This video is going to cover every step of the drop ceiling installation process from how to plan your layout, how to install the wall moldings, how to install the grid, and finally how to install the drop ceiling panels and cut out the penetrations for recessed lighting. I think this drop ceiling looks fantastic. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so we have a lot to cover in this video. So let's start with step one and plan out our ceiling grid layout. So it really shouldn't come as a surprise that a successful drop ceiling project starts with planning. If you're a little bit old school, you can use some graph paper and a calculator to map out your room grid, or you can use Armstrong Ceilings online resource, which allows you to enter your room dimensions, enter the size of your panels, enter the ceiling joist direction, and it's gonna calculate how many panels you're gonna need, and it's also gonna figure out the width of your border panels. It's pretty handy. Let's take a look at this example room, which is 132 inches by 104 inches. If we look at the horizontal run, you can see that we have room for five full 24 inch ceiling panels, which leaves us with 12 inches left over. You wanna divide that by two so that you have an even border panel on both sides of the room. In this case, that gives us six inches. You can apply that same concept for the 104 inch dimension of the room, and that's gonna give us four inches on each side for the border panels. After planning the grid layout, it's time to install the wall moldings. But before going any further, you should note that there's a few specific tools and materials you're gonna need to actually install this drop ceiling, and I'll link those down in the video description if you wanna check those out. To install the wall molding, you first need a level line across the wall, and to establish this, I recommend the use of a laser level, and check with the drop ceiling manufacturer to see how much clearance you need beneath the joist. And if you don't have a laser level, you can go old school and use a straight edge to mark a straight line across the wall. Next, take your 90 degree angle wall molding and position it so that it's even with the laser level that you established previously. Because the wall molding is made of metal, I found that self-tapping metal screws are the easiest to go through the molding and into the wall studs. Fasten the wall molding to the wall studs every 16 inches on center, which is standard for most walls. To cut the wall molding to the right length, use tin snips and it's honestly not difficult at all. I'll link the tin snips I used in the video description. If you're working alone, you can use painter's tape or bar clamps to hold one side of the wall molding molding while you fasten it to the wall studs. So the straight runs of the wall molding, that's easy. But now let's talk about how to do the inside corners and the outside corners. Those are a little bit trickier, but not much. So in this corner of the room, I'm gonna demonstrate the inside corner here. And according to the manufacturer, you're gonna butt up the two edges as shown. I found myself tucking one into the other, but that's probably not recommended. 
Now for the outside corner here, you can see that I got it level with that laser line, then I taped it in place, and now we're gonna cut a 45 degree miter using tin snips. The first thing I did was I marked where it was in line with the wall, and here's a quick representation of the 45 degree angle with a pencil. So I'm cutting the straight line first with the tin snips, then I'm gonna flip the wall molding over and cut that 45 degree angle. So after cutting both 45 degree miters, here's the inside corner and I can have the first 45 on the outside there. Then I'm gonna take the second 45 and butt it up against the first 45. This is just a quick mock-up for illustration purposes and don't worry, I'm gonna erase that pencil mark. So after cleaning up those 45 degree miters off camera, I'm gonna attach the wall molding to the wall using self-tapping screws, just like before. There's the first piece and here's the second piece that I'm installing right there. Looks pretty good. Continue to install your straight runs, your inside corners, and your outside corners of wall molding all around the room until you have a level wall molding all throughout. And after installing a wall molding, now's a good time to install any kind of soundproofing or insulation since the next steps are just going to get in the way of doing this. After installing the wall molding, it's time to install the hanger wire or the quick hang grid hook. So on the perimeter of the room, the drop ceiling grid is going to be supported by the wall molding, but in the center of the room, the grid is supported by either hanger wire or for residential projects like mine, quick hang hardware, which is much easier to install. Here's a look at the quick hang bracket, which attaches directly to the ceiling joist. And then we have our quick hang hook, which when we squeeze this together, we can slide it through like that turn it over, and then when we squeeze the tabs here, we can adjust the height of the hook. This is super simple to adjust and way easier than hanger wire. Let's install it. Because the quick hang hardware is used to support the main beams, we need to position it so that it's either one border panel's length away from the wall or a border panel's length plus 24 inches, which is the size of one standard ceiling panel. So what I'm doing here is using a tape measure to measure the distance, which is the border panel's length, plus around 24 inches, giving me about 30 inches from the wall. And then I used a laser level to establish an even line all the way across. If you don't have a laser line, you can tap in a temporary nail and use a chalk line to snap it. And this is gonna indicate exactly where you need to install the quick hang hardware on each of the joists. To install the quick hang hardware bracket, position it where you mark the line and then hammer in the temporary tabs to hold it in place temporarily. Then you can either use two nails through the tabs there or just one screw right down the middle. Continue to install quick hang brackets so that the spacing does not exceed four feet between them. After installing the quick hang brackets for the first main beam, repeat the exact same process for the next main beam, which is gonna be located four foot away from the first main beam. Snap a chalk line and attach the brackets to the joist just like before. At this point, you can install the quick hang hooks by pushing the tabs together and inserting the hook up through the perforations. If you have an obstruction at the top, like I do with this insulation, you wanna bend the hook out of the way as opposed to cutting it. Insert the quick hang hooks through all of the quick hang brackets that are part of your installation area. To set the height of the hooks, I recommend that you use a string line at the top of the wall molding, and the idea is that the bottom of the hooks will be even with the top of the wall molding. Squeeze the tabs together and adjust as needed. After installing the quick hang hardware, it's time to prepare and hang the main beams. But not so fast. You can't just go install a full piece of main beam because you need to trim the end of the main beam so that the cross T slot on the main beam is a border panel distance from the wall. This is gonna give you the perfect size opening for the drop ceiling panel we're gonna install later. So after determining how much of the main beam you need to cut off based on your grid layout, use tin snips to cut the top of the main beam first and then the bottom. This will give you a flat piece of beam that you're gonna rest on top of the wall molding. Place the cut end on top of the wall molding as shown and then you're gonna use the quick hang hooks to go through the circular perforations in the main beam. If you need to connect two pieces of main beam together, you're gonna to grab one side, grab the other, and there's tabs that you're gonna force into place and you should hear an audible click when it interlocks properly. Note that you'll have to cut the length of the second beam so that it interlocks with the first beam and so the end which you cut will land directly on top of the wall molding as shown. Repeat the process of measuring the main beam, cutting the main beam, placing the cut edge of the beam on the wall molding, hanging the main beam from the quick hang hardware, and finally interlocking two pieces of main beam together for all of the rest of the main beam you need for your project. Remember, the main beams need to be four feet apart. After installing the main beams, it's time to prepare and cut the border and cross tees. Let's start with the border tees, which are gonna go between the main beam and the wall molding. Position one end of the cross tee so that it's flush up against the wall, resting on top of the wall molding, and I like to mark in the center of the main beam for where I'm actually gonna cut that cross tee. 
After cutting it, you're gonna flip it around, put the cut edge on top of the wall molding, and then insert the uncut edge into the main beam. Repeat the process of measuring, marking, cutting, and installing the second border cross tee. And then we're gonna install two full four foot cross tees between the main beams in line with the first two border cross tees. The full four foot cross tees are super easy to install since they don't require any trimming. Just put them in the right perforation and then click it into place. And after that's done, we're gonna square the grid. To check if your grid is square, you're gonna measure the diagonal distance between the opposite sides of a two foot by four foot grid opening. And if that measurement is the same, the grid is square. If you measure both diagonals and it's not the same, you might need to do a little bit of trimming or tweaking until the measurements are the same. Don't proceed with the installation until confirming that your grid is square. After confirming that the grid is square, it's time to install the remaining grid and level the system. To install the remaining grid, I recommend that you start by installing the rest of the border cross tees, then install the four foot cross tees between the main beams, and then I would go back and install the two foot cross tees that go between the four foot cross tees. This is because we're using two foot by two foot ceiling panels. If we were using four foot by two foot panels, you wouldn't need to install those two foot cross tees between the four foot cross tees. Hopefully that makes sense. Install all of the remaining cross tees until your grid is complete. Lastly, take a magnetic level and stick it to each of the main beams to confirm that your grid is perfectly level. If you need to make any adjustments by adjusting the quick hang hooks, do that at this stage. At this point, we finally got to the fun part and we can install the drop ceiling panels. Armstrong manufactures a bunch of different styles of ceiling panels. I went with these 24 inch by 20 inch shallow coffers and also these 24 inch by 24 inch flat white panels. I needed to use two types and I'll show you why in just a second. So the first thing I did was install all of the full panels of the shallow coffers. And to do that, you're gonna insert it into the grid at an angle and then drop it down into place so it rests on the grid. Installing these drop ceiling panels isn't rocket science and it's actually pretty fun because you get to see the project finally start to come together. And unlike the traditional mineral fiber drop ceiling panels that are pretty rigid, these PVC shallow coffers are pretty flexible so you can bend them up into the grid and install them a lot more easily. Additionally, the PVC is gonna be moisture resistant in the event that any of the pipes in the ceiling ever leak which I really hope never happens. Also, make sure that you wash your hands before you install these drop ceiling panels for obvious reasons. Yo, bro, did you wash your hands before touching that ceiling tile? Me? No, why? Oh. To install the recessed lights you're seeing now, I used the template that came with the lights to mark the cutout, then cut it out with some tin snips. After cutting out the penetration, I inserted the recessed light, made sure that the tabs on the side of the light engaged, and made sure it was flush with the drop ceiling panel. Then, I hooked up the electrical, which was simply a screw-in connection, and then I inserted the drop ceiling panel into place, just like we did for the others. Repeat this process for all of the recessed lights that make up your drop ceiling layout. So at this point, we've installed all of the full 24 inch by 24 inch drop ceiling panels. And all we have left to do is to install the border panels, which are gonna require some cutting. Armstrong recommends that you don't cut the PVC shallow coffers. So that's why I had to buy the flat panels, which I'm gonna use for the borders. To install the border panels, first measure how big the border panels are gonna have to be, then use a straight edge and a utility knife to score and snap the PVC panels to the right size. After cutting the panels, install them in place and repeat this process for all of the rest of the border panels that are part of your installation. So at this point, you've completed all the steps in the drop ceiling installation. Let's take a quick reminder look of where we started. And here's a look at the final result. What's up everybody? On today's project, I'm gonna show you how I took this nasty, disgusting basement wall and turned it into this. This has a faux concrete wall, a wall hung TV, and an electronic fireplace. And I'm gonna show you how to install all of that. Let's get going. So here's the existing wall in my basement. Disgusting, as you can see. Was hoping to be able to keep the drywall, but immediate change order. It was moldy, it was gross, and because it's my house, that's coming out of my pocket. So now that we've removed the drywall and done a bit of cleanup work, let's talk about the overall design of this entertainment center wall. So this wall is gonna consist of a faux concrete topper wall, a wall hung TV, and then an electric fireplace. 
So the next step was to actually order an electric fireplace. I got mine off Amazon and it's gonna come with some rough in dimensions for the framing you're gonna need to do around the fireplace. Because in our case, it's gonna be recessed and it's gonna fit in that penetration. So the first thing we had to do is cut our framing lumber to size and frame up an opening for the fireplace. So after cutting the lumber to size based on the electric fireplace manufacturer's recommendations, I then used a Craig pocket hole jig to drill pocket holes in the lumber so that I could assemble it all together using pocket hole screws. I'll link this Craig pocket hole jig in the description, but it's pretty easy and it's a great way to assemble frames like this one. After using pocket screws to attach all four sides of the fireplace frame together, I used a level and a tape measure to find the exact center of the wall, and then I clamped it in place and marked the location where I need to cut out the studs. Bar clamps are great for holding things in place temporarily, so pick some up if you don't have them. Now, I cut out these studs using a sawzall. Don't freak out, it's not a load-bearing wall, everything's gonna be fine, I promise. So, I cut along the mark lines and the paneling in the back, I'm damaging it right now, but I'm gonna remove it later, so it's no big deal. So after cutting out those studs, I took my electric fireplace frame and I put it in place. I had to use a little bit of an elbow grease to get it to actually fit properly, but a couple hits with a hammer and we were golden. After checking that we were level, I secured the electric fireplace frame to the studs, and this doesn't have to be pretty, it's all gonna be covered by drywall. Just make sure it's secure. And because we're installing a wall hung TV, I wanted to install some blocking before I closed up the wall. That way I'll have a nice solid backing for where I hang the TV and where I mount the bracket. I won't have to look out for studs. So I cut that to size and also please uh, subscribe to the channel so I can afford a new shirt. What is going on? And then I secured that to the studs right above the electric fireplace in the center of the wall. Once all the framing is done, it's time to install drywall. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on drywall since I have another video on my channel showing how I drywall the entire basement, but here's a time lapse of me installing that now. You want to sink the drywall screws so that they're slightly recessed into the actual drywall so it's not poking out, and then I went on the inside and I cut out the penetration for the electric fireplace. To cut the drywall around the fireplace, I used something called a jab saw, and I'll link that as well as all the other tools and materials I use for this project in the video description down below. And the last step in drywall is to actually tape the seams using drywall tape and joint compound. Check out that other video on my channel for more info on drywall. So after getting the drywall hung, I thought it would be a good idea to do like a faux concrete wall. And I found this product from DIYConcrete.com, which essentially allows you to transform your drywall into a concrete by putting a thin layer of concrete over top. I'll link it in the description. Let's apply it and see how it goes. So the first step in applying this product is to apply this waterproofing and crack prevention membrane that looks alarmingly similar to Pepto-Bismol. So after dumping this product into the paint tray, use a nap roller and then we're going to apply a thin layer of this to the entire application area. We're just gonna roll back and forth, kind of like you would paint anything else. Not rocket science, we just gotta get it done. So this membrane product is gonna serve two functions. One, it's gonna be a waterproof barrier since the concrete we're gonna apply is gonna have moisture in it. And secondly, it's gonna have a bit of elasticity, which is gonna minimize the amount of cracking that concrete will do in the future. Also, I don't wanna miss the opportunity to show you guys the exact perfect positioning of a respirator on the face. And here's a look at our wall after we applied the waterproof membrane. After letting that dry, it's time to apply the base coat of concrete. The kit I ordered came with all the tools we're gonna need, and to get this party started, I mixed water and the base coat of concrete in a mixing bucket and used a drill with a mixer attachment to mix it up according to the manufacturer's instructions. Next, I put down some paper to protect my floor, which was pretty stupid considering my floor is horrific at this point. And then you're going to apply the base coat of concrete on top of the membrane. You're gonna use a hand trowel to do this, and you're basically gonna go back and forth making sure that you get a thin layer of coverage across the entire wall. I won't bore you by showing the entire application, but here's what it looked like after we applied it, and here's what it looked like after it dried. Next up, we mixed up the finished coat of concrete the exact same way as before, combining water and the finished coat and mixing it up with a drill mixer, and then we applied it just like before. In hindsight, I wish I would have went with a darker hue of concrete. They make some pigment powder that you can add to the mix, which makes it a little bit darker. I think that would have looked better. I'm not saying this looks bad. It's just a little bit lighter than I would have liked. After letting the finished coat dry, I applied some wet look sealer to the concrete. 
This is optional, but I just wanted to apply this to try to keep it looking clean and minimize the amount of staining that would occur over time. So both the wall hung TV and the electric fireplace are gonna need an outlet. And I actually wired up an outlet on the other side of that wall since I have kind of a closet, which is under the stairs. And if you wanna learn more about the electric I ran in my basement, you can check out the video linked above. And there's a look at the outlet in comparison to where the fireplace is gonna be mounted. And then I went through all the electrical checks to make sure that it was wired up properly. Quick disclaimer, all electrical work should be done by a licensed electrician. So at this point, we're getting to the fun part and we can start installing the electric fireplace. First, we need to remove the faceplate and to do that, there's a mounting screw you need to pull off. And now I'm gonna take off the faceplate in preparation for the installation. Remember, we framed around the perimeter, so actually screwing this thing to the wall is gonna be a breeze. So at this point, I took the fireplace and I inserted it into the penetration. Fortunately, we pre-measured and we did everything right. So it fit in there just like it should. And then I took the faceplate and put it on preliminarily just to make sure that it was gonna cover the edges and that we did a good job on the installation. After I was happy with it, I took the faceplate off again, confirmed that the fireplace was perfectly level. And after checking that, I used the provided hardware that came with the electric fireplace and I mounted the electric fireplace to the wall using the four screw penetrations as shown. After installing the last screw, I took the faceplate, mounted it on top of the fireplace, and then I reinstalled the set screw to lock it in place. After that, I grabbed the plug and I hooked it up to the power supply, which is our 20 amp GFCI outlet that we installed previously. And here's how it looks. Next up, we're gonna install the TV, but before that, I installed some MDF trim board on the sides of the wall and also some baseboard at the bottom to cover up those unsightly seams. Now for the final and best part, I installed a 65 inch Vizio TV. I bought the mounting bracket online and it was super easy to install because we put the blocking in previously. So I knew exactly where that was and I just screwed it directly into that blocking. Then I had to drill a hole for the electrical connection going from the TV to the outlet. And then we took the TV cable, thread it through that hole and then we mounted the TV to the bracket we installed previously. And with that, this project is complete. Let's take a quick reminder look of where we started. And here's a look at the final result. We've been driving around, singing songs way too loud because we wanna. Picking up a love friends, fill up the car to live best because we wanna. We wanna. Yeah, we just wanna have fun. The trunk's full of wine. We okay, guys, that's a wrap on this video. If it helped you out, please drop a like down below and subscribe to the channel this channel for more DIY content like this. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next one. Thank you guys so much for watching. That's a wrap on this basement finishing video. If you enjoyed it, please drop a like down below and subscribe to the channel for more DIY content like this. In the next video series, I'm going to show you how to add a bathroom to a basement. So if you want to see that, please subscribe. Thanks again. I'll see you on the next one.